Hi everyone, welcome to episode 18 of the Startup Playbook podcast. My name is Rohit Bhargava and each week I interview successful founders, investors and subject matter experts on how they got started, the strategies they used to succeed and their advice to current and future entrepreneurs. In this episode I interview Jody Fox. Jody is the co-founder and chief creative officer of Shoes of Prey, which allows women from around the world to design and create their own shoes. To date, Shoes of Prey has raised over 24.6 million US dollars, had over 6 million pairs of shoes designed on their site, and have opened up offline stores with David Jones in Australia and Nordstrom in the US. In this interview, Jody shares her insights on how to prioritize product features, how to build great teams, working with influencers, the power of offline marketing, and following Seth Godin's Purple Cow philosophy. Without further ado, here is my interview with Jody Fox. Hi, Jody. Welcome to the Startup Playbook podcast. Thanks a lot for making the time to, to be on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Not a problem at all. So um, for those people that, that aren't as familiar with Shoes of Prey, can you tell me a little bit about you and your background? <laughs> Happily. So Shoes of Prey is the website where women can design their own shoes. And we started back in October 2009. We launched into market, broke even at two months and hit multi-million revenue in under two years. To date, we've raised about 24.6 US million US dollars. Uh, we've had more than 6 million pairs of shoes designed on the website. And um, it's been an incredibly fun journey. We've also opened some offline stores with Nordstrom here in the US and one in Australia with David Jones. Fantastic. Obviously, phenomenal amount of growth um, that, that you've experienced since 2009. Um, I just wanted to go back even slightly into your, into your background. So you used to be a yeah. lawyer before you got into, into the startup space. Is that right? <laughs> that is correct. So uh, I used to be a banking and finance lawyer, and I practice with an, a firm now known as Ashurst in Australia. Um, I worked in insolvency litigation, and then I shifted across into the front end of the business, mostly in property and then into securitization. And it was a great Great grounding for understanding how the world and how business works, but um, sadly it didn't make me happy. <laughs> so I made a list of all the things that would make me happy, and I talked to anyone who would talk to me about their career. You know, what a good day looked like, what a bad day looked like, what the industry was doing, um, and then the thing that matched up most closely with, at that point in time with you know my list of things that would make me happy was advertising. So I went and learned how to build, learned how to build brands before realizing I didn't like any of my shoes, <laughs> <laughs> at which point, um, yeah, I'd started designing shoes because I'd stumbled across somebody who um, was able to take commissions of shoe designs and I just could never find anything I really loved. So I began to do that and my girlfriend's loved these shoes that they'd never seen before when I explained they asked me to make shoes for them as well um that all being said I wouldn't have thought to turn it into a business myself had it not been for um my two co-founders Michael Fox and Mike Knapp and you know they were both they both come from Google backgrounds Michael also had some really amazing retail uh training as well and um yeah they were just looking to get into e-commerce but needed an idea so when we all came together on that Shoes of Prayer was born Absolutely fantastic timing for, for all of you. But um, I mean, speaking, <laughs> speaking of timing as well, I imagine the, the climate in um, 2009 was to start a startup was very different to what it's like today. Um, oh my God. Yes. <laughs> what, were, what, were, what, what was it like? So, you, you know, you had, you had the concept, you had that sort of early, um, you know, problem that you yourself faced and, and you wanted to turn that into a business. Um, what <laughs> did that, um, what did that look like taking the, the concept and, and turning it into something real? Yeah, it was a lot tougher than it was today. I mean, thinking about particularly the Australian environment, it's actually pretty amazing right now with the kinds of grants that the government is giving, the focus of the Turnbull government on, you know, fostering entrepreneurs in Australia, uh, the, even the co-working spaces, and there just simply was none of that. And there were there was only a very few kind of funding options as well. So there's a huge amount that's changed in that period of time. Um, so I think gosh, how did we do it? I'm not sure. I don't think it ever crossed our minds to think that we couldn't do it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it was, that being said, I mean, it's not like it was simple. Um, and we certainly made plenty of mistakes along the way as well that um, could have, but fortunately were not fatal to the business. 
Sure. So what was the what was the first step for you? Um, uh, obviously, you know, it's, it's, it's a very unique business model as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you need sort of retail, uh, not retail, sorry. Uh, you need supply and, and manufacturing partners in place. Was that kind mm-hmm. of the, the first step that, that you had, that, that it was feasible to, to have kind of one-off manufacturing of shoes done? Yeah, I mean, just about. So, I mean, we came up with the idea and a little bit of the business plan behind it, and then we sought out potential suppliers. Um, But I think one of the important things about the way that we approached suppliers was, you know, making sure that we had the idea fleshed out enough to be taken seriously by them. Um, So, yeah, so the first step was business plan and putting together some semblance of a logo and company name Um, Mm -hmm. and then to go and speak to those suppliers about what we were doing and sharing with them why we were excited about it. Um, and, And how long was that process as well? So we took nine months from the inception of the idea to um, actually going live. But I will be honest in saying that I think that we probably focused on a few red herrings in that period of time. So, for example, with sizing, you know, we were so concerned about that and we experimented with sending people memory foam to step into and, you know, a whole host of things. And actually the thing that yielded the best results was just asking people to tell us their size. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, I guess um, you could only say these things with the benefit of hindsight, though. though. Yeah, was there, um, at, at that early stage, and I see a, a lot of early stage founders really struggling with this, is, you know, they, they want to provide a really complete solution um, mm. as, as the first sort of showing of, of their product before they launch. Um, and you know there are all these sort of exciting features that, that they kind of want to add. How do you how do you decide what to what to add in and, and what to leave out? Yeah, that's super tough. I think um, we even we even face that today. <laughs> Just trying to you know make sure that we're really focusing correctly and I think that um it's one of those things just takes time um and constant reassessment and um always trying to hold yourself really closely to the strategy that you've put in place and I know that as a team when we do that you know we have I stand on the shoulders of an incredible team um it's I'm so excited by the people who sit in shoes, the shoes of prey family and when we're all pointed in the same direction we can do really phenomenal things yeah, um, yeah, on on team as well. Uh, obviously, another critical element to to making a business succeed. Um, do you have any bits of advice for people that are looking for co-founders or looking for their first few hires? Oh, co-founders is a tough one. I'm really lucky that I didn't kind of have to go through that process too much. It all happened fairly organically um, because Mike, Michael, and I had met way back in law school. Um, probably noticed that Michael Fox and I have the same surname. He, we're actually ex-husband and wife, but <laughs> we're still good friends um, and function really well in the business together. Um, so, yeah, finding a good co-founder, I think that, you know, it can be done with friends, but it's just it's just really critical that you share a similar vision and that you have great communication and that you can be really frank with each other as well. Um, I think with respect to finding your first hires, um, we went for generalists who were just very smart people and, in fact, ended up hiring a whole lot of people who um, were unhappy lawyers. So, <laughs> <laughs> And that worked, has worked out really well for us. We have a number of people on the team who used to be in law and, um, yeah, we're, they're just such smart people. So it's a good team. Sure. Um, so I, I remember we actually spoke on the same panel for Decoded Fashion a couple of years oh ago. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Uh, that, was, <laughs> that was quite some time ago. But um, I think one of the things that you mentioned was uh, was the timing um, of you being able oh, yeah. to get those manufacturing partners in place, um, you know, around the GFC and things like that. Can you can you share a little bit about that that story? Yeah. So I think, like, I mean, the global financial crisis had just happened or was just starting out when we um, – started looking for suppliers and I sort of always harbor a bit of suspicion that that was one of the reasons that we were able to convince people to work with us because they were starting to see that um, their larger orders weren't coming in like they were in previous years because retailers were being hit pretty hard um, by the global financial crisis. So, I mean, I guess we'll never really know if it's true or not, but um, it's a a bit of a theory that I hold on to in my mind about, you know, why we were able to romance them over the line into making one thing at a time for us. Sure, um, and uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the the businesses as well, um, and going back to the production and manufacturing side of things, was there uh-huh. was there anything that um, that you specifically looked for in terms of manufacturing partners? 
Yeah, I mean, and we got more intelligent about this over time as well. So um, there's actually a great book about this, and it's called Poorly Made in China. Um, not that I believe that at all, actually. I think things get made very well in China. <laughs> um, but the um, the great, the amazing thing about it is it just talks about things to look for in the um, factories that you're visiting um, from things like, you know, dust on boxes that are sitting in storerooms all the way through to how many people are there, um, whether things are being actually taken off of the lot or not, because sometimes, um, and also to seeing if the person who you're dealing with can show you where their office is because there are so many tricks to the trade. Like you might be talking to someone who doesn't even work at that factory and they're kind of passing it off as their own factory. Right. So there's that. There's also, um, you know, so sometimes, you know, when they're looking for new customers, they will make it look like the factory is really busy, but actually they don't have any orders. So you just try looking for ways to get to the bottom of that. And then obviously to making sure that you're happy with the conditions as well. And, um, you know, that was certainly something at the front of our minds when we were um, working with other uh, suppliers, but now we have our own factory and produce all of our own shoes. Sure. So when you were when you were dealing with those initial uh, sort of suppliers, um, w- were you based over there uh, in, in China? I assume. No, or... no. So we were traveling there a lot and spending a lot of time there, though. But we were still uh, based in Sydney. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and any tips in, in terms of regions or, or places um, that people should go if they're kind of in the early stages of, of finding those suppliers? Mm, it really depends on what you're looking at manufacturing. It will probably determine where you need to go. But um, sort of the places that have – there's always big trade fairs globally for manufacturing of all kinds of things. So my first point of call would or my first sort of very general recommendation would be to say, find out where the trade fairs are for your particular product and go um, go turn up to those and see what people are doing, do the research there. Sure. It's a more efficient way to do it. Absolutely. Um, and so in, in terms of Shoes of Prey and, and finally coming around to the launch, you, you kind of mentioned and you touched on earlier that, um, you know, you received a significant amount of traction pretty much pretty much from, from the day that you launched. Um, mm-hmm. Can you talk a little bit about... Um, what some of the strategies were that you used to get your initial customers on board? Yeah, so, I mean, like, some of them were just so quick and dirty. Like, we sent an email out to literally every single person that we knew, and we included a discount in that that had trackable tracking code attached to it so that we could see how far that went. Yeah. Um, it was also uh, working – our first sort of major milestone was working with YouTube lovers. It was emailing, mag- you know, with magazines and letting them know what we were up to, gifting. Um, gosh, you know, I mean, it was kind of, in hindsight, I guess, a bit of a scattergun approach but um, because we just – wanted people to know we existed, um, which, and it's much more sophisticated now that we have an expert, fabulous marketing and PR team. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, yeah. On, on sort of YouTube bloggers, um, I saw there was, uh, one person in particular, Blair Fowler, that I think you mentioned, mm-hmm. um, early on. Can you talk a little bit about what, um, what a partnership, uh, with an influencer looks like? Yeah, so I'll caveat by saying like there are there are some really wonderful things that do happen with influencers, but the market is constantly changing, um, and there is a little bit of um, I guess I would say uh, you know some of this was really lightning in a bottle kind of stuff. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's just that moment. So what happened happened with her is that um, we were looking for a really big funnel of people to work with or to let know about what we were doing, and we wanted them you know, a few obvious things that we knew about them, female into fashion. And we didn't, we knew that we didn't have much budget. So um, it actually was Mike's idea to go to YouTube and have a look at what YouTube vloggers were doing. And he was like, hey, there's this girl, Blair. She's got more than half a million people subscribed. She's a beauty blogger, um, but she's started doing fashion as well. And she was publishing 10-minute videos three times a week and getting more than half a million views on each of her videos quite quickly. So to us as indicated she had a very engaged audience so we called her and or we emailed and said hey you know would you like to do something with us and her Hollywood agent wrote back to us and <laughs> said sure but she's she's about positive reviews so why don't you gift her the experience and if she likes it then we'll talk about doing a video so we did do that and luckily she liked what we were doing so um she created this 10 minute video and um and yes there were fees attached to it at that stage they were pretty affordable um today she's really not very affordable and she's doing very well for herself that's a pretty incredible businesswoman now 
Um, so, yeah, she did this 10-minute video and where she talked about how fun it was to design her shoes. Um, she genuinely enjoyed it. And um, we ran a competition off the back of it, which was design a pair of shoes, put the link to the shoes and note about where you'd wear them into the comments. And then we'll, the two, our two winners will make your shoes for you, yeah, the design for you. So I put it live and I wasn't really expecting a huge response but just because that competition was so um, intensive with what you had to do to enter it. Mm -hmm. um, but gosh, it was incredible. So we'd had over the period of the five months we'd been live about 200,000 unique visitors. The day that Blair's video went live, we had half a million people hit the website. Wow. Um, and we had 90,000 people enter the competition. So it made it the most commented video worldwide on YouTube that day. So it pushed it to the front page of YouTube, which is one of the most trafficked pages on the internet. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a really extraordinary experience. But the one thing that we really learned out of that was even though we had a huge amount of traffic, we actually didn't have very many sales. And when we started diving into that, we realized, oh my God, well, people watching 16 year olds put makeup on on YouTube are probably other 16 year olds. 12 year olds, you know, they're not, they're not actually the people who have $220 to spend on a pair of shoes. So, um, we had to figure out how to pivot all of this traffic into something that would be, um, useful. So we, um, we wrote a case study about it and sent it out to journalists and we ended up getting a hit with the Wall Street Journal and they wrote about it. And then once we started getting there, that's when we, um, that's when we started seeing sales come through and that's where we found our audience. So yeah, it was super interesting to go through that. And, you know, to this very day, we still watch the data and analytics very closely to understand what is and isn't working in the business yeah. and um, to be able to change and shift quickly. Yeah, I mean, um, on that, you know, one of the metrics that a lot of people focus on is, is the number of unique hits that they have, the number of uh, people that they're, that they're driving to the website, even though they might not be the, the right audience. Um, yeah, you know, which, which... And I mean, I'm always really suspicious when I see people entering competitions based on, um, and including in their entries things like, you know, how many people they have on their Facebook page because half the time they're not even active people. So um, there's no point having inactive people sitting on your page. They've got to be people that you actually care about spending time and money on. Absolutely. And in terms of in terms of metrics, um, are there any sort of particular metrics that you yourself track? Um, God, we have a ton of metrics that we track every single week. Um, a lot of them are quite particular to our business. Um, but then more generally speaking, we're tracking things like our net promoter score, um, sales, of course, and breaking those out by channel and country, um, you know, how many, you know, unique users and things like that. So, yeah, there's, there's a, quite a bit that we track and we also share those across the business once a week mm -hmm. as well. Um, so we have, you know, the, there's, you know, everyone in the business has a pretty good finger on the pulse with what's happening. Yeah, Absolutely. And in terms of you know shoes of prey, uh, obviously playing in the in the fashion space, um, Instagram would be a huge uh, channel for you. Um, but obviously, you know, again, it's uh, it's a very saturated market as well. Um, so in terms of social media and, and marketing efforts, how do you um, stand out from everything else that's that's happening? Hmm. I think look, we're still working on it. I don't think we've necessarily cracked that just yet, to be honest with you. And looking at the space, like it's such a constantly evolving um, environment as well in each of the individual channels. And you know, you have like the advent of something like Snapchat, which is only just starting to become popular with our with our target audience now. So um, I, I don't know that I have any particularly great advice in that realm, other than just always being present answering relevantly and fully, never hiding things, never spinning things, um, and sharing things that are you know, really authentic about what you believe or are experiencing in the brand. Sure. Are, are there any platforms that kind of stand out in, in terms of being able to, to generate uh, or further push um, the Shoes of Prey brand? Well, yes, I think you pretty much hit on it there. Like Instagram's a big one for us. Um, YouTube as well and, uh, and Facebook. Yeah. <clears throat> Perfect. And uh, again, I, I heard Michael speak at an event um, a, a couple of years ago, and one mm -hmm. of the things that he mentioned was uh, the purple cow philosophy. Oh, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. for, again, for, for those people that aren't familiar, can you explain what that is and how you sort of um, use that philosophy in, in the business? 
Yeah, absolutely. So the whole idea of the purple cow yeah. is that it's a Seth Godin theory, and he wrote a whole book on it, but it's a short book and it's worth a read. Um, so the idea was that if you went past a paddock then um, and you saw a black cow, a brown cow, and a white cow in the field, you probably wouldn't keep, you wouldn't stop. But if you went past that same field and you saw a purple cow, you'd stop, you'd take a photo on your smartphone, and you'd share it on you know, every single social media channel, you'd WhatsApp it to your friends, you'd, you know, all that kind of stuff. And that's because it's, it's currency, like it's, and it is something that tells people something about you and what you find fun. So, um, in the same way, we want to choose a prey to be something that people would want to talk about and share with one another. So that requires stepping outside of the usual, in our case, of just saying, here's a pair of shoes we made off the shelf, and instead offering you the chance to design them yourself and express your style. Sure, and uh, in terms of in terms of the business itself, like I mean, in in tech in general, um, you know, we we sometimes overlook the power of of offline um, marketing channels or, or just offline presence mm. generally. Um, you uh, Shoes of Prey has uh, has a bunch of retail partners with partnerships with David Jones and Nordstrom. That's uh, correct. Yeah. Can you? Again, can you sort of explain why why that was important for for the business to, to move into the offline space? And, yeah, absolutely. Uh, kind of yeah. So shoes of prey went into the offline space because we kept hearing our customers say things like, "I just want to know what my shoes look like in real life." <laughs> <laughs> and we were like, "Well, it's kind of how the business works." Um, but what? And literally, like people would just show up to our headquarters in Sydney, and they would be like, "Hey, I'm here on holidays. I just..." wanted to try a pair of shoes on, do you have any that I could have a look at? What we started to realize was they didn't actually care what the shoes looked like in real life. That wasn't the issue. It was the chance to touch the leathers, to know the quality, to see what they felt like on and all these kinds of things. So, um, but, you know, and the fact that they were just turning up on our doorstep was like, okay, we need to give these guys a physical space to go to. So that was kind of the, the advent of the idea. And then when we built the store with David Jones, um, we created an experience instead of um, something that, you know, wasn't off the shelf because it's absolutely not who we are. So, you know, we the experience is more around going into an environment where everything is built out of things we make shoes out of. So desks covered in leather, seats covered with different leathers as well. Um, sitting amongst sculptures of flowers that are two meters high, built out of shoes as opposed to looking at things on a shelf. Um, and then providing the sizing shoes, the leathers, and some experts to sit for you to help you to get to the shoe that you would like. Um, so that story in David joins it um it actually did double its forecast of revenue in the first 12 months wow. and the um the store design itself um became a finalist in the world retail awards in 2013 for the world's best store designs so there's up against you know Karl Lagerfeld and Puma and it was just incredible but um the crazy thing was like it was being hosted in Paris and none of us <laughs> went to the awards of course because it was in Paris um and it was Karl Lagerfeld um but yeah we got this phone started flashing at like three o'clock in the morning and we did actually win the world's best store design for 2013 so um it, you know knowing all of that we then approached Nordstrom here in the U.S to start working with them and we've opened five design studios with them mm -hmm. and we're just experimenting with you know how that model might work here which has been fun sure did you did you see it as being a, a channel to reach uh more of the mainstream audience as well Oh, totally. I mean, it's it, in my mind, it's as much about retail it is, is, as it is about marketing. Yeah. Um, and, and how did how did that that initial uh, sort of partnership with David Jones come about? We approached them. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, and so obviously now, uh, I think you you recently raised a uh, US fifteen million dollar round uh, Series B funding from Blue Sky, uh, Greycroft, uh, Nordstrom, and yep. Kosler. Um, yes. uh, to to kind of expand internationally, what what's been um some of the uh some of the challenges that you've faced? Yeah, so the first challenge is being growing up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like getting that sort of serious cash in the door from those kinds of investors has been. You know, there were lots of things that when you're in MVP mode that you kind of just um just kind of uh that you just kind of like run around with. Uh, sorry, I just had a message come in. Um, I'm so sorry, I'm multitasking. I shouldn't have looked. Um, so, yeah, like growing up, making sure that your reporting systems are great, making sure that um, you have good systems and processes in place for the team and for, you know, working with partners and things like that too. So it's actually taken a huge amount of thinking on our part, um, 
is more internally facing than we normally would have um, to be able to uh, you know, set the right foundations for the spend of that cash. Sure, and, and obviously, like I mean, in Australia, you were you were relatively well known. I, I imagine that you you had all of your connections and, and networks based um, based out of here, um, and now you're based out of the US. What what was uh, you know, uh, I guess moving into a space where you, where you aren't as well-known, um, where you don't have those connections, uh, it, is it even harder to, to be there? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of, it's definitely having to start from the beginning again in lots of ways. So, um, but yeah, I'm up for the adventure and I do think it's the right market for us to be doing that in. Sure. Um, and and what's it, what, what have been some of the other differences that you've seen in doing business in, the, uh, in Australia compared to the U.S.? Oh, my God, there's so many. I mean, all the way from understanding how the market works here in a country where effectively, like, every single state is a different country just in terms of what they wear and their attitudes and the, um, oh, my gosh, it's just so different. And so we really need to consider that about marketing. Um, the other thing that is uh, – you know, I mean, just from a style perspective as well. I mean, as an Australian woman, I had no idea that winter got so cold here that you needed, you couldn't wear ballet flats. <laughs> you know, this is not something that I think about as in, in Australia. So from a product perspective, it's been really different. And then also to just seeing how um, Australian corporates um behave compared to American corporates as well. There's lots of little cultural differences is what's appropriate and not appropriate in the workplace as well. And it's been quite humorous going through those actually. Sure. <laughs> Sure. Um, and, and what's next for, for Shoes of Prey? Um, so we have some really exciting launches happening over the next couple of months. So um, I'm unfortunately, well, actually not unfortunately, I don't want to spoil the surprise, but please stay tuned and hopefully we will surprise and delight you with some of the things that we have coming down the pipeline. Perfect. So on that, uh, if people want to want to stay up in touch with you or um, you know follow uh, the announcements that you're about to make, what's the best mm-hmm. way for them to, to do that? Um, so there's a few ways. I'm kind of a social media addict, so you can find me on YouTube at um, youtube.com forward slash Jodie Fox, so J-O-D-I-E-F-O-X. Um, you can find us at the website, um, obviously, so Shoes of Prey, that's P-R-E-Y dot com. Uh, you can also find me personally on Instagram at Jodie Ann Fox at, um, on, you know, on Instagram. And you can also find Shoes of Prey on Instagram too. Just shoes in the handle for that is Shoes of Prey. Um, so, yeah, come check us out and we'd love to hear from you. Perfect. I'll make sure that those links are in the show notes. Um, Jodie, thanks a lot for your, for your time and, and insights. Well, not at all. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a real pleasure. Likewise. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Thanks for listening to episode 18 of the Startup Playbook podcast. You can find the show notes of my interview with Jody, along with a curated list of tools and resources for startup founders at startupplaybook.co. As always, you can join the conversation through our Twitter account. The handle is at Playbook Startup. In episode 19, I sit down with Ben Dunphy, investment director of Blue Sky Venture Capital, a late stage VC firm that counts companies such as Shoes of Prey, Vinamofo and e-commerce as part of its portfolio. In the interview, Ben shares what a good board looks like, creating long-term value, and finding the right valuation for companies. Don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date with our latest episodes. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you at episode 19 later this week.